Good evening and welcome everyone to our Thursday evening presentation series. We're calling tonight's presentation In the Shadow of Washington, Hamilton and Lincoln, National Banking and the Economic Demands of Today's Crisis. We're, we are dedicating our discussion this evening to President's Day, which is coming up this Monday, February 20th. President's Day is a federal holiday, of course, that was first celebrated on February 22nd, 1800. Uh, to celebrate the birthday of George Washington, America's first president, and that was the year after he died. Washington's birthday was celebrated on February 22nd from 1879 until 1970. Then, in an act of largesse, the federal government uh, got together Congress to give federal employees a three-day weekend in 1968, and this was called the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, which moved this holiday to the third Monday in February, which can occur somewhere in between February 15th to the 21st. The day became known as President's Day and provides us an occasion to remember all U.S. presidents, presidents or to honor Abraham Lincoln and Washington's, Washington's birthdays together. In the first half of our program this evening, our presenters will talk about the historical basis for a U.S. public national bank, such as we've had in, previously in our history how these past institutions in our country allowed us to flourish and succeed as a nation, and how a present day National Infrastructure Bank can revitalize and rebuild the middle class and help restore our global competitiveness and strength as a nation. In the second half, we will be reporting from the ground. Our speakers hail from around the country and will be sharing with us the needs and progress of this movement in their regions of the country. My name is Julie Olson. I'm on the board of the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition, and I'm a business person in the Pacific Northwest and also chair of the Alaska Democrats Progressive Caucus. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here this evening and share this discussion with you. We have uh, quite a list of speakers that you see here this evening, and so we're going to get right to it. And at the end of our speakers, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. So please. Uh, a thought occurs to you over the course of these presentations, write it down and, and let's um, see if we can get an answer for you um, in the question and answer, answer, answer section. So with that, I'd like to go to our first speaker, Alfeka Mutardi. She's a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund uh, and the chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank. Alfeka, um, do you have an overview for us on HR 3339? Thank you very much. And welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us this evening uh, in our celebration and talk about President's Day. So uh, since that's our uh, theme, I wanted to start out with uh, giving you an overview of how six American presidents use something very much like a national infrastructure bank to help their economies uh, build for the general welfare and get ourselves out of economic difficulties. Uh, the six American presidents were George Washington, and then James Madison started a second Bank of the United States that was picked up by John Quincy Adams, Abraham Lincoln, and then Herbert Hoover started something called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation that was picked up by Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, you might notice just looking at this, that these six presidents were completely bipartisan, half-half on both sides of the aisle. And what they realized is they needed a national large public bank to help in building infrastructure and building out our economy and building our manufacturing and solving very large economic uh, conditions, crises, when our government fell into uh, a crisis period. What were those crises? The first one was the American Revolutionary War that left us in huge debt, and we were just simply an agrarian economy with no manufacturing at all. So the person that designed and built this bank was Alexander Hamilton, our first treasury secretary, and he used it to build manufacturing centers, our first manufacturing centers that started our industrial revolution. Um, our speakers are going to give you examples of how each one of these presidents used their banks. Uh, the final one was uh, Franklin Roosevelt's bank that was expanded to solve the problem of the Great Depression 
and win World War II, mobilize for World War II. So you can see that the banks were very successful. Unfortunately, they're not around anymore because they had a 20 year sunset clause in them. And there were a little bit of disputes on whether we should have a large national bank. The South not thinking that was such a good idea, the North wanting to do it, but pe presidents changed their mind over time. James Madison, a Southern um, planter, is an example. Uh, when he almost lost uh, the War of 1812 and everything got ruined uh, from the war, then he realized, oh, yes, we really need a, a bank like this. And that's when he, he started a second bank of the United States. So those are just examples of economic crises where presidents used a national bank, a central bank, to build out our economy. So how are we doing today? I'll just give you a quick rundown on where we... Oop, shoo, um, Gee, I'm sorry. Um, let me try that again. <laughs> I lost my slide deck. There we go. Uh, so, what? How is our? Uh, how, what does our economy look like today? We're not quite in a terrible crisis, but we seem to be heading for one. Uh, first of all, we came out of COVID. Uh, we have now high inflation on account of the supply shortages that COVID and the COVID downturn ca uh, caused. The bright spot is our labor market is doing quite well for now. Uh, unemployment is low. However, rising inflation means and rising rents means that our working poor, the lower portion of our uh, workers in, our, in this uh, nation are really stressed and having difficulty making ends meet. And then on top of that, we have a sort of reckless Fed policy uh, that it wants to tamp down on the economy, put people out of work, because they think that's the only way to solve the inflation problem. But it's going to have lasting negative impacts all over the place, it's going to crush small businesses, state and local finances. The banking sector could collapse because of it. And the stock market is already down. Uh, with uh, new re economic reports that came out just today, uh, you can see that the stock market is down once again. This, this policy is not going to fix our problem of supply chains problems, but a national infrastructure bank will. And then you add on top of that one condition that's very much like all the times before when presidents enacted a bank like this. We are $31.6 trillion in debt. The Congressional Budget Office says that this year's deficit will be $1.4 trillion. And then in years after, it'll go up to $2 trillion per year. Why? because of higher interest rates on pay paying the interest on the national debt. So if we go into recession, and a lot of people think we will, and this is the yield curve, a, an economic measure that when it goes below zero indicates we're going to have a recession. When that happens, um, the, the budget will not be able to bi bail us out of this recession. How will it, a national infrastructure bank help? The same way that it helped the eight presidents before, it'll create uh, millions of new great paying jobs. It'll build infrastructure to promote the general welfare, and that'll also build manufacturing. It can lean against a recession. Anybody that gets out of work can be hired up for these great paying jobs. Make America make again. Uh, this is um, Bob Hockett's favorite slogan. We love it. Um, and uh, we, we, let's manufacture in America and, and grow our uh, business and economy here and vastly stimulate production and supply. And for goodness sake, Let's get water to our farmers where we grow our food so that we don't have spiking food prices. Uh, we have a bill in Congress, HR 3339. It is currently being in redrafting right now. And when it gets reissued shortly, we hope, uh, it'll have a new bill number, but essentially it's the same. It'll create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. Why do we need a public bank? Because the budget can't do it. And this bank will work alongside the budget and finance all of our infrastructure projects. Really quickly, for those that are new on the call, and I apologize for repeating this, this is quickly how the bank works. It uses the Alexander Hamilton method of going to the private sector to see if they would like to invest their treasuries that they're holding for savings or investment purposes into the NIB in exchange for preferred stock that'll pay them a little extra. 
And that extra stream of money will come out of interest earnings from the bank. This bank is self-sustaining, doesn't need infusions from the budget to get it started or subsidize operations over time. That'll capitalize the bank, and then the bank will go on to give out loans exactly like a commercial bank does. The same money-creating process that a commercial bank uses, this bank will also use. Very flexible, low-cost lending and lending terms, and then borrowers can come in directly to, uh, uh, they could be a state, a city, could come in directly for a project that is that it owns, a school, a road, a bridge, and that way it'll bypass uh, all of the getting cut out of the process of getting very tight money uh, that's being dribbled out now from the bipartisan infrastructure law. They can come in directly for their own loans. And we'll cover everything, not only the 16 categories that the American Society of Civil Engineers say we need additional money for, additional above and beyond budgets to repair transportation, water, and upgrade our electric power grid, but we also know we need other things, a complete high-speed rail network all across the country, broadband everywhere, affordable housing, targeted to the very lowest income earners who need them the most. And by the way, let's hook up that affordable housing to mass transit so we can get our workers back and forth to work and they don't have to flee out of California or leave New York uh, because they can't afford to live there anymore. And then large scale water projects to address drought where we grow our nation's food supply. And of course, the bipartisan law is only gonna provide one tenth of the overall money we need. We'll need the NIB to top up and provide the rest. So with that, I'll turn it over to the other speakers who will give you details of how these American presidents used a bank like this. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Our next speaker is the esteemed Ellen Brown, chair of the Public Banking Institute out of Los Angeles, California. Ellen? Okay, so as Alfeca pointed out, uh, we have two crises on our hands. We have an infrastructure crisis and we have a, um, a federal budget crisis. So we have a debt ceiling gridlock in Congress and it doesn't show much hope of moving anytime soon. And the fact that the Federal Reserve is actually um, engaging in a quantitative easing, sh shrinking the money supply. I'm oh, sorry, quantitative tightening, shrinking the money supply. It's no longer buying bonds. It's actually selling federal debt. And the fact that the and it's uh, increasing the interest rates, which, as Elfeka points out, will um, will increase our debt by, yeah, okay. Um, but it's not the first time we've had this sort of crisis. Uh, sorry, I'm repeating much of what Elfeka said, but anyway, so our two illustrious presidents that we're celebrating this week, uh, Washington and Lincoln, both faced similar crises, and they got through it. What was through it? Uh, through what was called the American system by um, Henry, Senator Henry Clay and, um, and by Lincoln's monetary advisor, Henry Carey, the American system was money and credit issued by the government and focused on infrastructure and development. So the American system was key both to winning the Revolutionary War. Benjamin Franklin said, wasn't it amazing that we <laughs> won a war against a major world power just by printing these paper receipts that were basically, they were supposed to be receipts against um, tax revenues. Um, but the problem was it was a lot easier to issue the money than to pull it back in taxes, especially then when you didn't have the sort of tax system that we have set up today. Uh, so that worked quite well for getting the colonies on their feet until King George said they could no longer do it. And that triggered a, um, uh, depression because, of course, it uh, shrunk the money supply, and that was a major trigger of the revolution. So we won the revolution, but the problem was, of course, that the Continental, by the end of the revolution, had gone to virtually zero, and uh, the colonies, which were now states, were $44 million in debt. So there was a big dispute in Congress whether um, the federal government should undertake the debt of the colonies turned states. But Alexander Hamilton had, had this idea that um, we could use the debt, that we could turn it into equity as, and it, we could use it to our advantage. So he, um, um, they engaged in debt for equity swaps so you could trade your debt for a portion of uh, um, 
capital or stock in the first U.S. bank. And then um, loans would be based on the fractional reserve model. Hamilton wrote, it is a well-established fact that banks in good credit can circulate a far greater sum than the actual quantum of their capital in gold and silver. Of course, that was the model of the Bank of England, which was also very controversial because it, where the way the Bank of England used it, it was supposed to be for, um, it was basically for speculation by the bankers themselves. But uh, Hamilton's model was something different. The plan was to use this money for, um, to issue credit to the government and private interest for internal improvements and other economic development. And that was set out in Hamilton's system of public credit. So it was basically a national infrastructure and development bank. And so is the second US bank. And among other um, achievements, infrastructure achievements was the Erie Canal, quite impressive. But of course, Jackson shut the second US bank down and Lincoln came into office <laughs> dealing with the civil war. And uh, he was gonna have to borrow from the British banks or British backed banks um, at rates between, I think it was uh, 24 or 36%. So it was like about 30% on average for these loans, which would have basically enslaved us to England again. I mean, we just escaped and now we were gonna be uh, financial slaves of the British. So what Lincoln did was to revert to the American system of the American colonists. He issued paper greenbacks and he actually doubled the money supply. That's how much he issued. And at the same time, or during his uh, term, the national banking system was established um, the and the national banks the idea was to turn the state charter banks into national banks and you you could issue currency. The states were already, or the state charter banks were already issuing bank notes, but they were highly unstable. Nobody knew, they were supposedly backed by gold, but nobody knew how much gold was backing them. And there were always runs on the banks. It was the wildcat bank um, era. And so national banks had to be capitalized with uh, government debt or they were supposed to buy some of the government's debt. And again, debt was turned into equity. And then, so now Lincoln had two sources of income to fund the Civil War and rapid economic development. So it was both the greenbacks and this national banking system. And uh, rapid economic expansion included, the most impressive thing was the Transcontinental Railroad, which was finished in 1869. And what was particularly impressive was the fact that it, um, these loans that the government made actually returned a profit to the government. So we got that railroad essentially for free and, and made a profit on it. Although I know there's controversial aspects, the fact that we gave a lot of land to the railroad companies. But anyway, it turned a profit, good deal. We also got a telegraph system out of the deal. Um, railroad track expanded. Uh, agricultural mechanization like reapers and steam-powered thresher, threshers um, allowed agriculture to flourish. Factory output boomed and uh, harbor improvements allowed um, uh, tonnage nearly doubling during the, the war from, um, from sh ships. <laughs> so the money supply was doubled, but it didn't trigger inflation. Oh dear, you can't really see my chart here, but if you could see it, can you see it? Uh, if you could see it, the, the line is at the bottom and um, and you can see that in the 1860s, it was basically level and it didn't really take off until um, the 1970s, of course, when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard and a lot of speculation was allowed after that. So that's also controversial, but I won't go into why. It, it, there was some inflation during the Civil War, but according to Milton Friedman, it was uh, actually less than in other wars, and it was basically due to supply shortages, as typically happens in wars. So then Franklin Roosevelt built on that model. He had an, it was faced with an even worse economic crisis, which was the Great Depression and a world war, and he used the Reconstruction Finance Corporation for that which was not actually a bank, 
but it was government owned and uh, it started with a pretty modest $500 million in capitalization. And over the next 25 years, it lent or invested over $40 billion and it funded the New Deal and World War II. So we need a similar workaround. And our Congress is obviously not going to be spending new money for appropriations any, or for infrastructure anytime soon. Um, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was off budget, so it could fund programs without legislative approval and without counting toward budget expenditures, and that we could do that as well. Um, in fact, the National Infrastructure Bank could actually do more than the RFC because it, it is a real bank. It's a depository bank. So that means it can leverage its um, capital at 10 to 1, and it gets access to the Fed discount window, Fed funds, et cetera. Uh, and then cities, of course, would be the borrowing, or cities and states, local municipal governments would be the borrowers. But if they don't have the revenues, they can pay back the loans as was done in the 1930s with revenue bonds. So they were funded with the um, proceeds of the infrastructure they created. For instance, um, dams generated electricity or railroads generated uh, fees and those could pay back the loans. So like Washington, Lincoln and FDR, we too can turn debt into equity for in infrastructure and development and trigger a 21st century renaissance. Thank you very much, that's all I have. Thank you, Ellen, as usual, that was enlightening. And I do want to um, let everyone know that infrastructure banks still exist today. However, they are being used by other countries around the globe. It's just that we don't have one. And that's part of our push here today is to um, to enlist your help in creating a new national infrastructure bank that can take us into the future and allow us to be competitive with other countries around the, the, the world. Our next speaker is uh, an economist, a PhD, an author, and a former Wall Street executive. I'd like to welcome Dr. Nomi Prince. Hi there, everybody. Um, happy evening. It seems like we just did this. The time flies in between uh, some of these meetings, or at least I feel like I just did this. Um, and it is really good to be talking about these measures right before President's Day, as, as Elfek and, um, and Ellen have, have already you know, discussed, because we do have points in our history where things happened on substantive levels, and they happened because there was money around to make them happen. And that money could be leveraged into projects and products that we continue to use to this day. And what struck me from the last meeting, and I'm just going to sort of fill in here um, after Ellen and probably before Bob says more about it, um, is, is the Hoover Dam. Um, and, and one of the major projects that um, remains a major self-sustaining, profitable, monetized project that began um, under there it is, under President Hoover, who, who, who doesn't get a lot of credit for a lot of what happened during his presidency, mostly because um, he was president during the Great Depression. And most of what we know about that is how uh, basically Wall Street over leveraged all over the place internally on Wall Street and the stock market in real estate markets around the country, et cetera, not dissimilar to what happened in 2008 before and leading up to it. Um, and it was just a bad time for workers, for banks, for financing and everything else. And I was out at the Hoover Dam actually during COVID most recently, um, and it was empty, but it struck me as um, not the dam. The, there was not a lot of people around it because of COVID, it was, um, like all the sort of tourist parks were shut down. But the point is that it was basically just a magnificent example of bipartisan projects that emanated from Washington that were leveraged by private money and also by private companies with real actual workers to get things done. And we still use um, the power, the hydroelectric power from the Hoover Dam, um, not just to this day, but it basically created most of the sustainable, <laughs> sustained economies on the Southwest Coast. Um, it basically enabled Vegas to be Vegas. Um, it enabled an immense amount of power um, from channeling the Colorado River to be used throughout the West Coast at a time where the economy of the West relative to the economy 
uh, the financial economy in particular of the East um, was not keeping up. And when Hoover brought up the idea of what became the RFC, actually the, the initial part of the RFC in um, 1931, the other thing that was happening was the Federal Reserve was doing something that may sound familiar to you, but I'll just tell you what they were doing. They were creating money to buy treasury bonds from the banking system, giving the banking system cash and hoping that the banking system will use it for productive purposes to help the overall economy. That sounds familiar. It's because that was some of the earlier um, historical examples that we have of quantitative easing. Um, and what the Federal Reserve did around the same time where Hoover was trying to get the initial parts of the RFC, what became the RFC through Congress, um, is it created every single week, $26 million in cash. It gave it to Wall Street, again, QE back then, tinier, now it's in billions, then it was millions, but basically $26 million a week in cash, which became about $2 billion in quantitative easing money to Wall Street with the hope that it would stabilize the Wall Street banks, they would take the money they needed, and then they would turn around and on lend what they had left into the real economy. Now, probably not shocking, but they didn't do that. They kept the money. Um, and so what was happening on Wall Street and what was supposed to be happening because of how the Federal Reserve was structured and is still structured at the time to help Wall Street is something that we still have ongoing today. Um, that money is basically, and we talked about last time, I won't get into too much detail, but money is basically created um, in order to purchase bonds out of the banking system. And the idea from pre-2008 financial crisis uh, through today, almost $9 trillion of money of which was created, um, most of which is still on the Federal Reserve's book and the form of debt from the financial community um, was not on lent to the real economy. And it's certainly not going to fix the multi-trillion dollar cavity that we have in terms of infrastructure project financing to augment the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure after anything else that's passed in Congress to try and update um, and fix our, our infrastructure. So, so that's what's happening then. That's what's happening then, that's what's happening now. So we know amongst ourselves, and this is something that I think is useful to, to note to other people um, and Congress people and senators that we're basically um, trying to get to, to embrace this idea, um, is that Wall Street's not gonna do it. And that the nine trillion plus money that the Federal Reserve creates in order to buy debt from Wall Street isn't going to make its way into long-term infrastructure projects. And so that was something that was also happening at the time. So while Hoover was sitting there and looking at what was going on on Wall Street and trying to figure out how to basically fund the, the expansion of the United States along the Western coast um, at that time, that's how a lot of this idea was, was ultimately conceived. And then of course, grew far more substantial, um, as Alfeca noted, as Ellen noted, with the RFC that came to engulf many other projects outside of the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam remains um, one of the largest projects that it ever funded. There were six companies that bid on the initial um, work. So private companies that bid on the initial work, they're called the six companies. They were really run by a company called Bechtel, which today is massive. Um, but at the time was run by like a dad and his sons. It was, it was tiny. Um, and so, you know, cast yourself back in history. This was also an example where it were companies that were smaller than they ultimately uh, became, were able to, to collectively bid on projects to basically augment the power of the Western coast. And they got 50 million, 49 point uh, something million dollars from the RC ultimately, um, as, as Ellen was talking about, the, 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 and as, as Alfeca talks about, the money that was created from producing the electricity that comes from um, the generators around the Hoover Dam has enabled economies to grow, jobs to be created. It has profited um, in terms of an investment, and it has also been able to sustain itself with the money that it collects through um, electric bills and, and other things. So it's a self-sustaining, ultimately, um, profit machine. It took a minute, um, but during that period of time, it was a bipartisan, basically collective um, financing arrangement, not in the form of a national infrastructure bank, but certainly in terms of a non-private Wall Street oriented funding mechanism. And it was used, um, the RFC, to basically create something that, that is 
that can be seen from from space, I think, so, or at least there's a there's a piece there that, that says it can be seen from space. So so the point is, we have that capacity, we have that history, um, we have the history, not just of how to create that financing structure, um, of which the National Infrastructure Bank basically takes the best of both worlds, i.e. the world where there is there's a government initiating component, um, there is debt, there is a self-sustaining ultimately set of projects that will be um, green lighted and augmented through the use of the loans that come from the National Infrastructure Bank. And it really tees off of from a historical perspective as we go into President's Day, and I'll, I'll throw in Hoover, um, just because he had some bad luck, but he did have some good ideas. Um, and he did work with FDR, and, and he also worked with a number of Republican presidents into that period of time, um, into presidents who were able to sort of harness um, out of the box, or at least out of the box for that period in history, um, methods to get projects done. And so um, just, just to finish, I think that one of the things or one of the arguments that um, we can make to both sides of the aisle, and I know there's many or more Democrats who tend to support this idea because of the public um, sort of growth and good nature of what the projects can do. Although, of course, everybody should want infrastructure should to, to be built, and, and, and at some level they do. But again, not just the no new debt, but just the fact that we have this historical precedent for bipartisan um, initiatives that can also leave behind massive pieces of infrastructure that do have the capacity to bring the economy forward, that do power it, um, and that do create um, all of the jobs and the money that, um, that, that we talk about here. And I think that should be something that is embraced by both sides of the aisle and something to um, basically remind both sides of the aisle. You know, we, we, we've done this before, not just the bank, but the, the partnership um, and, and the means and, and the way to push us forward. Thank, thank you, Naomi. Appreciate your insights on that. Uh, next, I would like to go with Professor Robert Hockett, the Edward Cornell Professor of Law and Finance at the Cornell Law School in New York. Professor Hockett. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me again. Um, it's an honor once again to co-present with, uh, with Naomi, Alfeka, uh, and Ellen, uh, and Julie in particular. Um, I think what I'm going to do is what I typically do with this particularly esteemed lineup, and that is to um, riff off of some of the very important historical observations that they've given us on the one hand, and then some of the more sort of structural or sort of mechanical how it works uh, observations that Alfeca gave us, sort of draw them together uh, in order to make uh, an additional point that I think helps sort of further buttress our, our case. So um, it's sometimes sort of understood or recognized that infrastructure investment um, or a public sector role in the conduct of uh, infrastructure investment is a good thing or a helpful thing, sometimes even a, a necessary thing. Uh, and it's also sometimes understood that there are a lot of um, really uh, illuminating historical case studies that can be drawn upon uh, to sort of indicate the truth of that or to sort of concretize um, uh, the truth of that. Um, but maybe sometimes those things aren't all drawn together in some people's minds to sort of understand why it is um, that it's been such a successful historical model uh, time and time again uh, for the public sector to enter into the markets in order to sort of supplement uh, the operations of private sector entities um, in order to provide certain basic prerequisites to a well-functioning private sector market. Um, so I thought what I'd do is maybe highlight a couple of those, um, what are sometimes referred to by the orthodox economists as market failures, but also highlight the sense in which the orthodox understanding of market failure is a little bit unduly narrow uh, for my tastes. And if we understand the notion of market failure a little bit more broadly or a little bit more uh, sort of imaginatively, uh, we can appreciate even better, uh, even more fully, why it is that there has to be a public sector involvement here and why it is that we typically get so very much bang for the buck when we do, in fact, uh, supplement the operations of private sector actors with certain critical public um, institutions uh, again, again, and again, and again. So uh, to begin with, right, the, the classic public, um, uh, the, pub the classic argument for uh, the public infrastructure or the classic sort of market failure that sort of pointed to um, it has to do with the idea of a what's called a public good, right? Something that is actually beneficial uh, to everybody, but doesn't lend itself to the capture of, of private sector profits, right? By individual um, uh, corporations, firms, other productive units, and hence tends to go sort of chronically 
undersupplied, right, or socially suboptimally supplied when we rely on the private sector alone to do that. So you can imagine all sorts of um, familiar cases of this sort, right, that all sorts of cases where there are various benefits that come through some sort of infrastructure where those benefits can't be sort of translated into profits that would incentivize a private sector entity to sort of provide the infrastructure in question, uh, and hence wouldn't be adequate to keep uh, a CEO uh, sort of in good stead with his or her shareholders if they were sort of demanding profits right away. Um, you know, the, the typical examples are things like roads and bridges that you can't charge user fees for, uh, or protection against pollution that you can't, um, you know, sort of easily keep out of your yard or other uh, places where we don't want the pollution to come. Um, uh, and basically, again, any place where the private sector can't sort of, in effect, uh, zone off or fence off or limit access to the infrastructure in question in a way that they can then uh, condition uh, use of the infrastructure on payments, fees of some sort, uh, or licensing of some sort. What I think tends to go maybe underappreciated sometimes is the, the 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 large number of kinds of fundamental or critical infrastructure or critical critical public action that sort of fit that description, even though they're not sort of regularly um, uh, sort of rattled off uh, in the uh, typical sort of casebook examples of, of market failure or public goods for that matter. So if you think about all the kinds of public investment that can tend essentially to stoke economic growth in sort of big synergistic ways across sectors in particular regions of the country or in the country uh, as a whole, there's no way to sort of capture uh, the benefits of those sort of synergies in a manner that can be translated into profits to shareholders. And hence, there's absolutely no interest uh, for a private sector firm or its executive board uh, to sort of pursue or sort of bring about those sorts of synergies. And yet, because those sorts of synergies do tend to generate a great deal of economic growth, and because, and because economic growth in turn translates into a high larger revenue take by the tax authority, by the IRS, right? And essentially the tax take rises when the economy grows. You, if you think about that, if you think about things that way, economic growth itself is a kind of public good in that sense. And any sorts of measures that can be taken that sort of encourage that kind of economic growth, but are not themselves immediately profitable to undertake are projects in effect that the public sector should undertake because the public sector actually is able to recoup those costs or to enhance the revenue uh, that it takes in when it does these things, which then of course offsets any particular expense that it incurs. Um, all of this is even all the more true if we're talking about an entity like an infrastructure bank that doesn't itself use a taxing authority, but instead um, essentially uses borrowing authority to engage in various forms of public investment. So one example, just one very very typical example or very sort of straightforward example to sort of make this sort of viscerally appreciate, uh, appreciable. Um, when the Germans overran France um, in early June of 1940, it kind of shocked the entire American public. It was a bigger moment in a way, even than the launch of Sputnik by the Soviet Union in 1957, right? Because everybody had anticipated that a second world war between Germany and France and other allies would essentially be sort of a replay of the first world war where everybody would be sort of trapped in trenches for four years and there'd be very little movement. And so everything would be static and sort of stay the same. Um, but Germany, um, again, overran France in a mere six weeks by using a new sort of style of warfare and nobody had sort of anticipated, it seems, that this would happen. And so everybody was sort of flabbergasted and worried and thinking, wow, we really won't have time. We won't have a whole lot of time to mobilize against Germany if we end up entering this war in the way that we had to mobilize against Germany when we ultimately decided to enter the First World War. So it was realized that we would need essentially a kind of a crash program uh, economy-wide to mobilize the country in order to enable it either to avert war through deterrence or to win a war if we ended up being uh, sort of drawn in. So President Roosevelt, you know, goes before Congress in a sort of emergency session and says, look, you know, the Germans have just overrun France in six weeks. Nobody thought this was possible. We're going to need to kind of get our act together. And we're short of all sorts of supplies, all sorts of things that we have to produce. Um, I need, for example, 50,000 warplanes to be manufactured per year starting this year. And if you remember, or if you go back and look at the data of the time, in the previous year, before Roosevelt issued his demand for 50,000 planes a year, 
The U.S. economy produced a grand total of 3,500 planes, most of them for civilian use and not fit for wartime use. You can see why many people thought that uh, Roosevelt must be taking advantage of his then recent removal of uh, the prohibition um, that prevented people from drinking and might have been uh, sort of imbibing a little bit much before uh, giving that talk. Uh, they thought, how, what's he been smoking or what's he been drinking? How are we ever going to get to that point? Well, that was just one little microcosm of a much larger macrocosm of challenges, right? In addition to needing to produce mass uh, quantities of warplanes, we were going to have to produce mass quantities of tanks and jeeps and the like, and lots of warships, and not just ships that were fit for battle, but also, of course, the so-called, the vaunted, the later celebrated liberty ships that sort of ship supplies to our allies, as well as to our own troops abroad, once we uh, started sending our troops abroad. So shipbuilding on a massive scale was going to be necessary. All of this mobilization, this productive mobilization was going to happen very, very quickly. Now, here's the key point I want to draw out. There's a There was a, a, a critical need to coordinate certain kinds of productive activity even for individual acts of productivity to work. So take the case of shipbuilding, for example. Henry Kaiser, private sector figure, well known even back then, still known today primarily for the health plan that he developed for his workers during the Roosevelt era, um, which was also, by the way, a federal product, but more on that in a moment. Henry Kaiser said, I have a great idea for how to build ships really, really quickly. Effectively, they're going to be sort of prefab ships. We're going to build the different parts in various parts of the country and then assemble them together in one great big giant shipyard out in the sort of outpost of California that had very little population at the time called Richmond. Of course, a very well-known city in California today. So he says, okay, I can build the shipyard there, but I'm going to need a lot of workers to be able to come over and help build these ships. And you know, gosh, come to think of it, it might be helpful uh, to get the workers out here to build all of these ships really quickly on the double if they had places to live um, out in this area that doesn't have housing yet. And hell, you know, it might be kind of good if we had power lines that were able to go to those houses so that they have electricity and the like in their homes when they move there. And you know what, There's there, some of them are gonna have kids. They might even give birth to kids while they're working. And I mean, literally give birth to kids while they're working because the Rosie the Riveter movement sort of began at that time too. We didn't have the luxury of, of keeping women out of the workforce any longer or African-Americans out of the workforce. But he thought, oh, you know, it might be good if we, uh, if they're having kids, it might be kind of good to have schools or daycare centers or kindergartens in the area as well. And you know, we might need roads, might need roads both to enable people to get to the factories back and forth from their homes homes, and also to ship the bloody ship parts over to various other parts of the country where they're going to be assembled with other ship parts to uh, to build entire Liberty ships, right? And then the thought was, well, you know, furthermore, I guess if the kids are there, they're not only going to need schools, they might need health care centers, right? And the workers themselves might need health care centers or doctors or hospitals or what have you. And in essence, what was recognized was that if you want to do something even as simple as massively uh, levering up your production of ships, you also were going to have to massively lever up your production of homes, electric power lines, electric power generation, fuel movements, fuel pipes, roadways, doctors, schools, housing, and the like. And it was recognized that all of every bit of that, all of those individual pieces of just this one puzzle piece, the shipbuilding matter, had to be put in place for any one of them to work, right? You had to have all of it or you would have none of it. Now, here's why I'm emphasizing this at the moment. There is simply no private sector entity either capable of or incentivized to bring complete package deals of that kind when we have a massive productive mobilization problem in the country. The problem I just cited with respect to shipbuilding could be recited again when it came to tank building, when it came to warplane building, when it came to sort of redoing factories or repurposing various factories that were originally made for one purpose to another purpose, when it came to moving entire huge populations of laborers to places where they could actually be productive in ways that it was now a national existential necessity to render them or enable them to be productive. And there's simply no private sector entity that has the capacity to do that or has the incentive to do that. And if there were, we would be very, very worried because that would be essentially a firm that was both horizontally and, and, and uh, vertically integrated in a way that essentially made a mockery of all of our antitrust laws. So we wouldn't even tolerate it if it were possible for private entities to do that. And what that suggests to me is that another critical sort of infrastructural function or another essential public function 
when it comes to the product, the project of national rebuilding or the remobilization of the nation's productive capacities, this time in the in the cause of saving the world from burning, right? Saving the world from cataclysmic climate change rather than saving it from Nazis, it's going to require the same kind of mobilization, the same kind of synergistic action, the same kind of coordinative action. And if a private sector entity is neither able to do that, nor the kind of entity that we would want to make able to do that, there is only one alternative. We have to exercise our collective agency to handle this massive collective action problem. We have a word for collective agency or collective agents. We call them governments, or at least we used to. And then the question becomes, what form of government exercise of collective agency is requisite? What kinds of government institution are best situated or suited to do the thing that needs doing, to do this kind of thing, to supply this form of essential public good, this form of sort of meta infrastructure, I'll call it, that sort of combines infrastructures in synergistically product productive ways. And that, it seems to me, is on the one hand, some kind of coordinating body within the federal government and a complementary financing body that works in tandem with it. And that model, that model of sort of pairing up a coordination council or a coordinated body on the one hand, with a financing entity that itself has coordinated capacity and also the capacity to put together packages of financing modalities that are suitable to particular combinations of sub projects that go into constituting larger projects is a model that we've done again and again and again. And that's why Hamilton gave us not just, of course, the first bank of the US, but also the society for the promotion of useful manufacturers, right? It's also why President Lincoln brought us not only immense financial reform, a complete monetary reconstruction of our monetary system with the National Bank Act, the Currency Act, and the Legal Tender Act in 1862 through 64, but also empowered the quartermaster general of the US military at the time to plan and coordinate the Civil War effort to prevent the country from falling apart, essentially to address yet another existential crisis. It's also then why in the First World War, the prototype on the one hand for the RFC, the War Finance Corporation or the WFC was invented or put into place by President Wilson and run by Bernard Barrick, but also there was a War Industries Board put into place to do the coordinating in conjunction with the War Finance Corporation. And that pairing up worked so well that when we got to the point of the Great Depression and then the World War II mobilization, President Hoover, God bless him, who had served um, in the Wilson administration and was a, an immensely innovative thinker in his own right, just as Nomi suggested, an immensely inventive and and um, and um, innovative uh, 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 designer of institutions, came up with the idea of reinstituting or bringing back the War Finance Corporation, but now calling it a Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And then it's why Roosevelt, when he came into office, both kept that RFC, but expanded it. In fact, probably about half the New Deal was just Roosevelt getting Herbert Hoover ideas, Republican ideas that were great ideas, but just needed to be done more boldly and, and to, to go bigger with. Um, this is what he did with the RFC on the one hand, but then he also uh, replicated the War Industries Board in a number of forms. There was, of course, um, uh, the War Production Board, which is a direct counterpart to the War Industries Board to sort of coordinate all of these things. There was a Defense Homes Corporation to build homes for all of these workers that had to move. There was a Defense Power Corporation. There were all sorts of other entities that basically helped to coordinate, but they always worked in tandem with the most essential of them all, which was the RFC. So I think one way of looking at what we're talking about now then, and one way of looking um, at the bank that Alfeca has so ingeniously designed and Ellen has helped uh, ingeniously design as well, as basically updating the RFC model for the present time in a manner that can, that can then work in conjunction with maybe a, a savvier presidential cabinet that might take national development or constant redevelopment as an ongoing imperative seriously in the way that our earlier uh, founders uh, did, uh, or might work in tandem with some sort of development strategy and coordination council of the kind that I've pushed in another piece of legislation that's now being sponsored by Rokana on the one hand and Marco Rubio on the other. 
whatever the sort of coordination body turns out to be, it's going to have to work. It's going to be essential for it to work with a counterpart financing arm. And the NIB, I think, just is the perfect, um, the perfect vehicle uh, to do that, the way to replicate that particular model that served us so well in so many previous eras. And hopefully this time we won't ever disband it. Hopefully this time we learn our lesson. Since we've had to recreate this five different times, Maybe it'll finally strike us that, well, you know, it'd be kind of cool is if we never had to recreate it again, because if we, if we just kept it in place and recognized that the need that it fills, the gaps that it fills, the public goods that it supplies don't go away. They're all, the need for that is always there, such that we should think of, um, of, of national development as a kind of continuous or perpetual process of, of, of national self-renewal then I think we'll be in great shape. I'll close with another, you know, once again, I'll quote to the point of nauseating my dear friends here. Um, my favorite development <laughs> economist, who some of you might not never have heard of, a guy named Robert Zimmerman, better known as Bob Dylan, um, who gave us a wonderful line from one of his best, best songs of all time, It's All Right, Ma, where he said, he not busy being born is busy dying. And I think the same can be said of an economy. An economy not busy being reborn is busy dying. So let's not die again. Let's stay reborn. Let's keep re rebirthing. Let's keep renewing. Let's stay fresh, young, and productive forever. Thank you, Professor Hockett. That was great. You know, uh, we do these calls around the country, for, um, and one of the common questions that we get from people is uh, along the lines of, gosh, everything sounds so great about a national infrastructure bank. Why does anybody object to it? And one of the objections that we have gotten um, on occasion is people will say, and this is, would typically come from a more conservative or Republican a legislator, a congressperson that we're trying to talk to about uh, sponsoring our legislation. And they'll say, oh, well, I'm a small government guy or gal. And I think uh, what Bob, one of the principal points he was getting across here, Professor Hockett, was that there are some places where government really needs to be. And that is in the, the, um, the production and the placing of public goods. And uh, I just want to quote, uh, you know, what Bob said is that the private sector uh, is only able to sub or the private sector is only able to suboptimally supply these items. So when you're talking to a conservative uh, legislator or congressperson or councilman in your area, if they say, oh, I'm a small government guy, I couldn't possibly support this. We need to remind them that this is where government should rightly be, is in the production and the development of public goods. So thank you, Bob, for that. And also, I do want to remind everybody that this video will be up on our website um, just shortly after uh, we end tonight. So you will be able to go back and refresh uh, yourself on the arguments that were presented here by Professor Hockett. So uh, thanks again. So now what we're going to do is briefly get to our reports from uh, uh, re our, some of our um, supporters around the country. And so first of all, I would like to go to uh, Senator Bruce Ennis, who's a former Delaware State Senator. Senator Ennis? Hey, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first off, I want to mention uh, to the, those assembled tonight that uh, my initial contact with the uh, National Infrastructure Bank Coalition was at the end of January in 2021. And at that time, the, our legislature was about to end for that season. We run from uh, a period of uh, January to June uh, for the legislative session in Delaware. And when I returned in January 2022, I introduced a Senate resolution number 25 at the time, really would urge the Delaware uh, congressional delegation and President Biden, who's from Delaware, you know, to support HR 339. Now, the NLB correlation established a date of January 27th. Of 2022 as a day of motivation to jumpstart support for uh, HR uh, 339. And that very day, Delaware being the first seat, I thought it was an appropriate time to bring that bill to the floor in the Senate. And we were fortunate at 3.46 p.m. on the day of motivation of the coalition's effort to get that bill passed uh, and sent a resolution passed and sent to our congressional delegation. 
Uh, you know, it's no, it's no secret that America's vital uh, infrastructure is crumbling, certainly more uh, faster than we can currently fund any upkeep and any repair. Uh, President Biden's uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill we talked about earlier, over a million, one trillion dollars, but only 550 million went to what we really know as infrastructure. And as it was stated, indicated that only 10% of really what was needed. But states across the country and still need a reliable and long-term uh, source of funding to cover the remaining $5 trillion needed to bring our nation roads and bridges. And you know all the other items uh, it would benefit. I won't go into that. Uh, to compete with the 21st century. Uh, I will say also that the um, HR, HR 3339 was the latest iteration of federal uh, legislation to create the infrastructure bank. Uh, and it did not receive a vote, as you know, in spite of the fact that it was uh, um, a situation where we had 20 labor unions, nearly 30, 30 city councils and, and county boards. Uh, we had 20 US senators uh, and many other uh, leaders across the country. So here we are again at a situation where we have to introduce a new bill. And I agree with the statement that was made uh, by a professor that we need to have this bill so it doesn't sunset. Also, I want to mention that according to the American uh, Society for Civil Engineers report uh, for America, uh, infrastructure uh, more than $2.5 trillion is needed because it's uh, strictly uh, uh, unfunded. And the remainder of the inequity uh, is that inadequately funded, which calls for another $5 trillion that is stated. Also, Delaware General Assembly uh, Joint Capital Improvement Committee uh, has been uh, attempting to close the gap here in the state by having record-breaking funding for infrastructural improvements in Delaware. In fact, over the last two, three years, last year was $1.3 billion for infrastructure loan in our, in our bond bill. Yet in Delaware, according to the report from the uh, Engineering, we have 63, uh, uh, we have 63 of the 83 uh, dams in the first state that are still rated as having high hazard uh, potential. We have 16% of Delaware roadways are still in poor condition. We have 28 bridges are rated structurally deficient. And the capital expense gap for public schools in Delaware right now is $102 million. And the total drinking water and wastewater infrastructure needs exceed $1 billion. Again, according to the SCCE uh, report. You know, from the founding of this country to the Transcontinental Railroad, to the New Deal, and to the new effort, the effort during World War II, national infrastructure banks have played a, a central role in, in America. Greatest period of growth and prosperity. Now more than ever, we need a funding system that's removed from politics, separate from the federal budget, and grounded in restoring our country's greatness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Ennis. As usual, we appreciate your remarks and appreciate your support in the great state of Delaware. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Middle America, and uh, we have with us tonight Lisa Hicks Clayton, uh, who has a career in government and is currently the treasurer of Dearborn Heights, Michigan. Hi, yes, um, good evening, everyone. Greetings from the Great Lakes state of Michigan. My name is Lisa Hicks Clayton. And as mentioned, I am a municipal treasurer, was a city council member for nearly 10 years before that. Also former deputy chief of staff for Michigan State Senator Betty Jean Alexander. And I'm also, a graduate of the Asset Management Champion Program, which is part of the Michigan Infrastructure Council in partnership with the Canadian Asset Network. So this is a subject that's very near and dear to me. 
And as treasurer, we've heard this over and over this evening about the funding and a stable, sustainable funding source. Um, I like to always share a little bit about Michigan and, and talk about infrastructure. We've heard of different types of infrastructure, right? We've talked about roadways. Those are things that we see, we drive on. Uh, there's sewage, there's the water, there's the com communication network with broadband transportation systems and school systems. So I like to start with roads because our governor, Governor Whitmer, if you all remember from 2018, maybe you don't, I do. Um, her whole motto was fix the DAMN roads. <laughs> so that, you know, we really take to heart around here in Michigan. We know that it will cost the state of Michigan $4 billion per year to fix those roads. We know that it cost our vehicle drivers over $19 billion a year to fix those roads. The cost per driver for repairs to a car annually is a little under $5,000. Yet, if we were to actually fix those roads, it would cost each driver a little over $900. So that's some really good information to know, right? Fix those roads. We also have another thing that we talk about very near and dear to us, and that's the lead service lines. I'm sure many communities were older communities. Um, Flint, people think about Flint, Benton Harbor, Detroit. Those in particular are communities um, that are economically stressed. They are people of color uh, and minorities. So they have over four excuse me, 40,000 lead lines just between those communities that need to be replaced. The total cost they're looking at would be about $1.3 billion. Yeah, the other thing I wanna to talk to you about, and this is very near and dear to, to, to my heart because I have a personal friend that this happened to and she's joining us tonight and please forgive me for sharing your story but we don't talk very often about our schools and we don't talk about our school infrastructure. Many of our communities in Michigan and probably across America, the schools were put in the middle of neighborhoods when neighborhoods were developed in particular in Southeast Michigan where I'm from in the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s. That's where one where the lead lines come from that need to be replaced. The state is mandated those are replaced, but what we're not doing, what we're not doing, at least here, is requiring the school districts, the schools to upgrade their infrastructure. Um, we have had cases where children have died in schools. There, um, and that is a really sad story to tell. One child is too many. And um, that's why I share that to talk about that. We talk about funding. Um, I'm a treasurer, municipal treasurer. I'm gonna tell you a story of a, a community in Michigan where I'm from, Dearborn Heights, which is Southeast Michigan, right, out of si right outside of Detroit. And uh, we have right now six CSO, okay? That's combined sewer overflow projects that are mandated, okay? And of course they're unfunded mandates. So we have to figure out this community that we live in, how to complete six CSO projects. We bonded for 25 million back in 2021, 25 million. That was to cover three of the projects. We are now at one and a half and out of money, okay? We have not begun to replace the water meters and the water lines that were part of that project. So now we had another three projects brought on to us and we're trying to decide how to fund it. Um, we're looking at another $45 million price tag, okay? Our options at this point, do you add them to your utility rates, your water rates? We have the highest water rates in the region. So that's probably not something we wanna do. Our only other option, 
is to go out for uh, taxes, for a millage. But either way you look at it, you're adding more money to your families. And that's not what anyone, anyone wants to do. So really that's the story that I share with you this evening. And again, it's about working together and finding something sustainable, cost-effective, and real funding solutions for our communities, not just Michigan, but across the United States. And we in Michigan, we had a Michigan resolution that was adopted by every single Democrat senator, except for one. However, what we're missing is we need to work across the aisle. We need to bring in our Republican counterparts to get this thing across the finish line. We've had several communities come on with re resolutions. Hopefully city of Detroit will join that. But again, without working together, we're not bringing it home when we need to for our, our citizens and our families. And that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, you shared some points that I think other people around the, the country are feeling and seeing in their areas. Um, okay, and now what, what I'd like to do is um, stay in Ohio, or go to Ohio, and I think everybody's heard about the disastrous uh, train derailment that we recently had there. As many of you know, I'm, um, the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition is calling for a large investment in rail infrastructure across the country, uh, and I also understand that um, the uh, the railroad involved in this derailment recent in the recent period spent $10 billion on stock buybacks instead of investing that money in safety improvements, new electronic braking systems and, and such. So what I'd like to do is go to Ohio Representative Sean Brennan, and perhaps he could weigh in on some of those infrastructure needs we have there in Ohio. Sean? Oh, thanks. Um, hold on just a second here. Um, I wasn't uh, I wasn't prepared to speak tonight, but uh, but I, I would echo a lot of what uh, what other folks said. I mean, Ohio suffers from a lot of the same uh, issues that we see around the country. Right. I mean, I served on Parma City Council, which is Ohio's seventh largest city for the last 19 years. Uh, and I just uh, went down to the legislature in Columbus uh, in January. Um, and, you know, as a city council member, one of the biggest complaints you get are uh, roads, sewers, water lines. Um, and, uh, you know, in the state of Ohio, uh, we've had a problem where um, for decades, our, our communities depended on uh, local government funds uh, that were distributed to our communities. But Unfortunately, over the last decade, uh, those state funds have been cut back quite drastically. In fact, um, uh, our uh, auditor and treasurer uh, here in Parma, uh, which is the biggest city in my district, um, estimate that uh, Parma has lost about $25 million. Um, you know, I look at that and, and just think about the infrastructure improvements we could have made. And, you know, we, like a lot of cities, uh, again, we've got problems with, uh, sewer lines just that just cannot um, address the capacity uh, of the amount of uh, precipitation that we receive now uh, because of climate change, for instance. Uh, and our residents are clamoring for us to do something about it. But um, as we all know, um, you know, when the state is cutting back your funding uh, and the voters uh, uh, obviously don't want to tax themselves more, it makes it quite a challenge. So when uh, Representative Joe Miller, my, my colleague, and by the way, former school teacher like myself, um, uh, told me about your, um, your proposals, uh, it really uh, made me fascinated. Uh, and I'm really happy that I was able to be a part of it tonight. I, uh, I was a social studies teacher uh, over the last uh, 30 years and um, you know, taught a lot about government and economics. Um, so uh, I know a little bit about that history that uh, that some of our speakers alluded to tonight. Um, and it's just too bad that there were sunsets put on uh, some of those programs over the years, because, you know, like, for instance, in Parma, when we passed uh, legislation um, that required our residents to pay into a uh, capital sewer uh, program, uh, there were many residents that asked me, asked me, you know, how long is this program going to last? 
And I said, well, how long do you think sewer lines will need to be maintained? <laughs> uh, I said, you know, this is going to go in per in perpetuity. And he says, well, I don't flood. So why should I pay? And of course, my retort was, you know, first of all, be happy you haven't flooded. Uh, secondly, there's no guarantee that you won't flood tomorrow. Um, so um, so I, I'd really like to see that if we're able to get this program off the ground, that it that it does go into perpetuity um, because those infrastructure needs uh, aren't going anywhere. Uh, the need will uh, uh, will no doubt increase over time as our population continues to grow and our cities will uh, uh, probably continue to uh, to sprawl uh, because it doesn't seem like that issue is being addressed anytime uh, real soon either. So I could go on and on and on because I have been a lecturer for 30 years, but I think that pretty much sums up uh, my perspective on it. I thank you very much for having me tonight. Okay, thank you, Representative Brennan, and we appreciate your support. Okay, um, I want to um, uh, move on with our program as I'm sure we have questions um, and discussion that we would like to uh, engage in with our speakers. So first of all, I wanna give everyone an update on some of the um, the great progress that we have uh, managed to accomplish already here in 2023. So uh, first of all, I want to uh, make sure everyone understands that um, the legislation, the bill, uh, is being redrafted and will be reintroduced into this Congress. So they are currently working on it, and we hope to have it reintroduced soon. It will in all likely ha likelihood have a new bill number. So right now, we're calling it HR 3339. Um, when it's reintroduced, it will probably have a different bill number, but it's going to be essentially the same content. So that is happening. Uh, today, uh, National Infrastructure Bank representatives testified before the New Jersey Assembly Special Committee on Infrastructure. Um, I think we have the re resolution to show, and um, we are hoping to get the state of New Jersey to come out in support of a, uh, the National Infrastructure Bank. Last week, we addressed the Pueblo, Colorado City Council and the mayor for 30 minutes. A resolution was passed this past Monday. So i um, uh, love to see that progress in Colorado. Uh, then we've got a group that's been working very hard in Washington State. Um, the Washington State Senate conducted a hearing on the resolution that passed and will be brought up for debate in the Washington House soon. Uh, in fact, we had a Zoom call, well, we had several Zoom calls this week with Washington State House members um, building support for the resolution. Uh, some other resolutions that have passed since January of 2023, we uh, received a letter in support of the legislation from the National Jobs for All Network. We have um, uh, a resolution has been passed by the Fresno Council on Governments. Uh, we've also got the San Francisco Board of Supervisors on board. Um, last year, for those of you who don't know, uh, the LA City Council came out in support of the National Infrastructure Bank. And resolutions that have been filed, um, in addition to the New Jersey and Washington State uh, Senates, are uh, also the Arizona State Senate, the New Mexico State Senate, and the New York City Council. So we are working around the country to build support for the creating a national infrastructure bank. Um, what I'll do is just briefly tell you a little bit about our organization. We are a 100% volunteer organization. We, um, we uh, rely on the efforts of the, our volunteers who um, uh, set up these meetings, set up Zoom meetings, contact legislators and conference people around the country. Um, do we have a slide on the on the, the national? There we go. Um, the National Infrastructure Bank. Here's our website. We maintain. We put on these um, monthly um, webinars to educate the public, um, and so really a, a volunt totally volunteer effort by a group of very committed people who who want to see this important change made for the future of our country. Um, I do want to point out that um, here uh, you see uh, action page noted. So if you are looking for a quick and easy way to see what our most recent activities are, you can go to our website and click on action page. And then another really important thing I want to point out to you is the donate button. And so our organization depends 100% on donations from the public. 
Uh, we do not have any um, you know, corporate donors. We don't have any PAC donors. We're, we are really relying on the support of just regular folks like, like you all, the people on this call. Although we are working on some grant applications and we hope to be successful in that so that we can expand our efforts, expand our outreach and do more advertising. So I uh, would really appreciate it if any of the folks on this call would be um, uh, generous and click on that donate button and um, help us in our efforts to get the word out about the National Infrastructure Day. Okay, um, so with that, what I'd like to do is uh, open up the floor for questions. Does anybody have a question for any of our speakers? If you'd like to raise a hand, um, I'll be happy to to call on you. And in the meantime, what I'd like to do is, so if somebody says to you, oh, I'm a small government person and I don't believe in creating more uh, government entities, what, what could just a regular person say in defense of a national infrastructure bank? How about NOMI? Well, I, I would just ask that person if they've ever driven their car on a highway, you know, like between states, um, or they've basically ever, you know, sort of gone from one place to another in an airplane and use an airport. I mean, the, the reality is that though some of those things were, were built by congressional initiatives, but in order for us to really expand upon the money that's already appropriated through Congress, we just have much more to do today than we've had to do in, in the future. Um, so, so the answer, this, this is not about growing the government. In fact, it's actually about shrinking the government. It's, it's, it's about leveraging the power of the government as it exists in order to finance the projects that we actually need and actually ultimately take the government out of the equation. So this is, if small government's your thing, um, but you, you, you use any mode of transportation from A to B or, or energy from A to B, you 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 should assume that this is a way to actually make the government more efficient and therefore actually decrease the size of the government by taking the money part, putting it separately out there, and allowing that to be what finances um, the things that we need. Thank, thank you, Nomi. Uh, that's a really good point. I also want to address one of the comments in the chat. Um, Stephen Sittig asks, will the NIB's investment policies vary with each presidential administration? Well, possibly, but, but let's remember that this bank is going to be open to all uh, political entities across the country. So essentially this is trickle up. Local communities will prioritize what is important to them in their area, and then they will apply for funding to the National Infrastructure Bank. So it's going to allow communities that are more concerned with green energy and climate change issues to address those and areas where um, lead pipes are the number one issue to make that their priority. So it gives a lot of power to local communities to, um, to do the most important projects for their area. I see we have a lot of hands up, so I'd like to go with Tabitha Kerr. Tabitha, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I live in Michigan. Actually, I know Lisa. I fight for yearly school inspections to prevent childhood injury and death. And um, going from the American Society of Civil Engineers grade of D plus with our schools in Michigan and throughout the United States, it stated that we don't know the future of our education system by 2026. Uh, in that same report, it mentioned that Congress stated that the needs and conditions of our schools remain elusive. And I don't, I don't know how much more elusive I can be in my state, to be honest with you. I've been fighting for six years. And how do we get more people involved? Because with the information, I made a 510 page book outlining childhood injury and death in our schools. And there isn't really much because just like our infrastructure, there's, there's no cause and effect, meaning there's no also no OSHA for kids in the education system. So we don't understand the cause and effect with infrastructure and our children's injuries or deaths. Okay, but, thank um, you. We're gonna, um, thank you. So your question is surrounding infrastructure investment in our school systems. 
Yes. Um, okay. Then, why don't we Why don't we go to one of our experts and um, see Alfeca? Would you like to weigh in on that? Yes, I've read the same ASCII report you have, Tapitha, uh, where they they admit uh, that they don't understand what's going on with the uh, infra the school infrastructure, but nonetheless they think there might be a two hundred and fifty billion dollar gap uh, in our fi financing for hard infrastructure for, for schools, and the National Infrastructure Bank will cover all of that. And we want to do it in the same way that Bob Hockett is describing. We want to build out new communities with better transportation, with no lead in the pipes, not from the streets, not going into the schools, nothing like that. And we want to build 21st century schools. Almost all of our schools have reached their useful lifetime uh, and uh, they, they've, they're just expiring. Staircases have fallen down on children. That kind of thing is going on. And we want to really build out our STEM uh, education and train workers up for great 21st century, great paying jobs, bringing back manufacturing. We need a whole shift uh, in our education system. We're really going to need the school, the teaching um, um, community to help with this. Uh, it can be done. It was done before. And the bank is really concerned about this and wants to have it a big emphasis of what we call infrastructure. Thanks. I would Thanks definitely like to be involved with that. Um, well, since you have been on our uh, our webinar tonight, you will be on our mailing list. So uh, we'll be happy to um, uh, get you into the fold. Okay, um, next I would like to go uh, back to Ohio. We are um, fortunate to have Craig Schwartz with us tonight. He recently was a candidate for Congress and spent many months uh, stomping around rural Ohio. Craig, did you have a question or a comment? And and we need to keep it brief because- I'll we've try to keep it, yeah, thanks, Julia. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Uh, I was on the phone today with Representative Joe Miller, who's heading up our effort in Ohio to get a resolution in front of the Democratic Caucus. They're moving uh, ahead very well. And we could possibly also reach across the aisle and see somebody from the, uh, or some, for some people from the uh, Republican caucus will sign on as well. They are gonna to move towards uh, having a resolution. That means a, a, a bill and possible committee hearings and things like that. So it's moving ahead uh, nicely. I just wanted to comment real quickly about a couple of things. Uh, the small government thing I find interesting, uh, go ask people in East Palestine if they want small government right about now. I mean, we have a disconnect going on, and I don't, I don't know if you've been aware, but this was national news a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Nazi homeschool was unearthed here, right here in Upper, my hometown. Mm. Now, going back to what Bob Hockett just said about how we use the RSC to fight Nazism and everything else, well, uh, history is uh, circling right back because we're right, we have a great disconnect going on right now. So we have a disinvestment in public education, in our public infrastructure. Those are the two things that the Nazi homeschooling in East Palestine have actually in common. And we've got to rebuild the public trust in public institutions. And that's what I see about the NIB. And that's why I push so hard for this. Uh, we, could, we could really make inroads with the local communities and reach across both aisles at a time that we need to be restoring public trust in public institutions. So, thank you, thank, yeah. thank you, Craig. Appreciate that. Yeah. I do want to let everyone know that the, the volunteers in the in the coalition every day we talk about and strategize about which Republicans we're going to talk to today and ask to get on board. And we have multiple Zoom calls every week with Republicans. So we are very earnestly um, trying to get Republicans to uh, come out in public and get on board with the infrastructure bank. And so if any of you um, uh, have a, a Republican congressperson or a state legislator and you'd like us to set up a Zoom call with them, we'd be happy to do it. We are building support across the aisle for this legislation. Okay, let's go on to Don Seekins. You've got your hand up. Do you have a question? Briefly. Uh, yeah, no, uh, yes, a very quick question. Alfeca, I was up in Oakland, California today, and I again went by this intractable problem of homeless people living in tents on the street and in RVs. Last one of these meetings, you said something about this bill can use the system that Austria or someone in Europe uses to solve this problem, and I don't understand exactly. These people have no money. 
even if you build a low cost housing, how can I answer the city council's question? Well, if we adopt this, how can we pay, for, put people in these apartments and get it paid for? Right. I'm, I'm going to turn that over to Alfeca, but first of all, I would just like to point out that a lot of these people do have money. They get Social Security disability or Social Security or other transfer yeah. payments. Yeah. It's just that they're not getting enough money to rent an apartment because housing is so expensive. So that's one issue. But uh, Alfeca, uh, would you like to address Don's question? Yeah, the question for California is the same as the question for New York. Both of those two states have very high per capita rates of homelessness and housing insecurity. And most of it is caused by very high rental prices and housing prices. So we in some way need to have a system to build more affordable housing units. And by the way, the 7 million units that the National Infrastructure Bank will build and finance, that is the only large swath of public housing that is in any bill anywhere. Most of the states are still relying on the method that is not working. Uh, New York just unveiled, their governor just unveiled a, a housing proposal to try and encourage uh, private developers when they're developing in exchange for giving them a more intensive zoning um, um, okay, that they would build a few affordable housing units. And then there's uh, no tax incentives there in place to provide the private developers a tax incentive. And there's no stream of subsidy money in place to subsidize these units over time. And what's happening is that the private developer owns the unit and is not getting the subsidy. Somehow they manage to kick the, the low renter person out of the house uh, to rent it for a higher amount of money, and then it no longer is affordable housing. The uh, Vienna Austria model is completely different. Uh, what it does is it has half of the units are owned by the city of Vienna, the other half are owned by private developers, and they're paid with a subsidy tax. So everybody in the city pays a, a housing tax, um, but the beauty of it is, is that nearly 50% of the uh, housing units in Vienna are through this low cost housing subsidy uh, paid for by that tax. And the, the, the large quantity of public housing is pushing down the price of rentals in the whole city. So everybody benefits from actually having this tax, but it is a secure, what's missing from this is a secure stream of subsidized money. And we're going to come up with a way not only to fund these 7 million units, but to make sure that they stay as affordable housing and they have a good stream of financing coming from, from a source. Uh, probably the it needs the cooperation of the local zoning uh, authorities to help make this happen. Thanks, Alfeca. Okay, I would like to go with, um, is it Dario Blackburn? You've got your hand up, do you have a question? You're muted. Okay, yes. <clears throat> I would like to know um, if the, um, it begins to look like our hospital and healthcare system is falling apart across <laughs> our country, across the world basically. Could this National Infrastructure Bank be used to finance a new healthcare system if this one continues to disintegrate? I just wonder if it, you know, from uh, Robert, Robert Hoke's talk, he was okay. talking about these different elements that, you know, would be necessary. And I wondered if that could be considered infrastructure. If we really, if our system just simply falls apart, can we actually finance something like that? Yeah. Thank you, Daryl. You know, there are public hospital districts um, across the country that are publicly owned. So um, as we view it right now, any uh, public entity would be able to apply for financing. And so that might be an opportunity for um, hospitals or clinics in many of those rural areas to get the financing they need to be able to modernize and expand their services and that sort of thing. Afeka, did you have an add-on comment you'd like to make on that? Yeah, this is this falls again into the area of um, the holistic community development that Bob Hockett is talking about. I mean, people need in a community, they need schools, roads, bridges, transportation, clean water, electricity, good communications, all of these things, and especially they need them in rural areas. 
uh, that's where the hospitals are dying and being shut down. Uh, so we can help with telehealth and telecommunications and updating those kinds of things. But hospitals are something, uh, as Julie suggests, if we can get a public entity or a public uh, municipal organization together, then we can lend into a new hospital uh, because it's publicly owned. Okay, thank you. So we'll go with Tom Galloway. Tom, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a comment or two. Um, Sean Brunner, it's good to see you on a call. Craig, it's good to see you on a call. Um, the current House Speaker in Ohio was a co-sponsor along with Lisa Sebecki for a resolution in the previous House. So they have had a resolution on uh, 3339 and the current Speaker of the House is aware of it because he was the Republican co-sponsor. Those would be people to talk to. Um, you know, we got it, you know, Every, everybody in Ohio is well aware of what rail infrastructure is like right now. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of pressure that needs to be put on the corporations to uh, work on uh, compliance with regulations or else we're gonna have to go back to uh, regulating the rail industry again like it was when I first started in 1966. That's my comment. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate your help. Um, what I'd like to do is um, go to Ellen Brown of the Public Banking Institute. She's been very active in uh, helping groups around the country um, work on creating uh, state public banks. And we also have a representative from Washington State Public Banking here, Dr. Ruth Fruland. But I'd like to, um, Ellen, to briefly, maybe can you tell us about this resurgence and in interest in state public banking around the country? Uh, yes, we, we have a number of states that are working on it and cities, municipalities. We have actually two Republican states that have now filed bills for uh, state-owned banks. Um, following the Bank of North Dakota model, of course, North Dakota is a Republican state and it's our only state-owned bank and it's done stellar work for decades, but particularly since the um, the 2008-2009 financial collapse, they, they their model is pretty much what we're trying to do on the, on the federal level here, where the Bank of North Dakota partners with the local banks. So so it's the local bank that actually decides what work they need, or well, they, you know, they take the loans and they then they ask the Bank of North Dakota for help and then they, they get funding for um or they get help with liquidity and capitalization, et cetera. So, and Ruth is in Washington. I see your hands up. So, Ruth, do you want to? Uh, we're going to go to her next. So, who are the two Republican states where they've um, they're, they've introduced uh, legislation on public banking? Uh, Tennessee and New Hampshire. Oh, wonderful! Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Ruth, did you have a, a quick question? Uh, well, no, a comment, actually. Okay. Uh, Seattle just passed uh, Initiative 135, uh, which is to create a public developer equipped with the tools to build, acquire, own, and manage housing that will stay affordable forever. And I put the link to it in the um, chat. I just wanted that to bring that to your attention, that we had, uh, that's, that's a huge step ahead, and I believe it is modeled uh, much on the of uh, Vienna model of social housing. Thank you, Ruth, really appreciate that. Um, okay, and then I see we have Walt McCree here. I believe he is the chair emeritus of the Public Banking Institute. And as I understand it, you testified at the New Jersey Assembly today. Is that right, Walt? I, I did, uh, I did. It was very interesting to see the great support for the NIB uh, and the, the great need that there is for new money in the system. My comment, just briefly, is that when we talk about the, the role the, uh, of, of the, the bank uh, as a permanent piece of infrastructure, funding, financing uh, is infrastructure. Uh, and what we're seeing all over the country and in all, in all kinds of sectors of the economy is the need for the public to reclaim control of this. And that's what the NIB is doing, but that's also what the public banking movement is about, is to bring the power of creating money 
uh, in the Hamiltonian way into all of our communities and cities and, and wresting some of that control from Wall Street and putting it into the communities that uh, and to the projects uh, that uh, we all know need to be done. Wonderful. Thank you, Walt. Okay, um, next we're going to go to Timothy Bruning, who has his hand up. Timothy, do you have a question or a comment? Yes, if the House GOP forces a federal default, how will the NIB be capitalized since the U.S. Treasury bonds you plan to use would now be worthless? Okay, um, well, I think we're going to go to uh, one of our economists, Dr. Prinz, and let her comment on whether or not you think the GOP is going to let the U.S. default on the full faith and credit of our country. Um, okay, so so Tim, I I have looked at all of the the past um, drama that occurs every time the debt ceiling comes up for for a vote or raising the debt ceiling comes up for a vote. Um, historically, and every single time, ultimately, it has been raised. And in fact, the actual debt at this particular moment is a little bit higher than the debt ceiling. And there's ways that the Treasury Department can sort of like accounting sleight of hand anyway, um, to sort of do what it needs to do around the edges while like the squabble is going on in Congress. So I mean, I'll, I'll let Alfeca answer what might happen if, if there were a default. But the reality is that um, this is all posturing, and it's posturing into appropriations committee conversations, to budget conversations. It's basically um, a bunch of Congress people trying to get what they want from other bills, and in doing so, holding up the sort of debt ceiling cap raise vote in the process. But ultimately, there's going to be compromises outside of the debt ceiling, which will enable the debt ceiling to be raised, um, because that's what happens now but i will say that the national infrastructure bank were it to utilize debt that already exists and we've talked about this many many times um would would actually enable there to be less debt needed um, in order to fund other parts of the united states government and projects related to infrastructure in particular um, because it would be effectively leveraging and monetizing the debt or some of the debt that already exists but again congress is ultimately going to raise the debt ceiling. Thank you, Nomi, for those words of reassurance. Um, okay, um, now one of our previous um, uh, questioners had uh, made a comment about how do we get more people involved because um, I, I don't know if she said everyone's tired, but maybe that's just what I think is that people are tired. They're stressed out. Um, they, they may be working two or three jobs. They don't have childcare. They don't have elder care. Uh, we've got a lot of issues in our country we need to confront, and and we believe that the National Infrastructure Bank has the capacity to to help with many of those things because we have the the ability to uh, address uh, homelessness. We have the ability to address the need for decent paying uh, middle class jobs and um, the training and the education that goes along with those. And what I'd like to do is call on. Um, two of our, our champions here in the coalition, and that would be Bob Lynn and Lou Spencer. Uh, both of them are from the building trades. And, and I think um, briefly, maybe if you gentlemen could address the training and uh, the benefits that we would see in that way for the American people, that would be great. Um, Lou, I see you're, you've unmuted. Can you sure. address that briefly? Yeah, sure. The apprenticeship training programs are uh a great way for people to come into the trade during the pandemic. We have a lot of people that decided on a second career. We actually see uh, adults coming in and applying for apprenticeship. The apprenticeship programs are self-funded through contributions that are negotiated with the contractors through the collective bargaining process. Um, the journeyman members of the local unions are already paying for the apprenticeship training programs. They are just sitting there waiting for the applicants to come in carpenters, plumbers, electricians, laborers, you name it. Uh, we can take people, train them, and prepare them for the jobs that the National Infrastructure Bank is going to create. So um, it's a great way to earn a living. Come into the trades, get the training, earn while you learn, go out on the job site, and uh, earn a decent living. Lou, so, can, uh, I, 
Could I yeah. ask you a question in this in this sure. category? A lot of the folks we talk to, a lot of the members of uh, the legislatures and say, keep saying, harping on, oh, there's a huge labor shortage. We can't find qualified electricians and plumbers and other things. Uh, is there something that's uh, holding up people? You know, you have a, you are offering a higher pay. You're offering full benefits. You're offering actually a better job than somebody that has two or three low paying jobs. Is there a particular holdup for people to, to switch over and come into the trades? Sure. The, in the private sector, you know, our contractors compete every day in the open market, and there's a lot of low road contractors. Project labor agreements, prevailing wage, the, the National Infrastructure Bank will pay Davis-Bacon prevailing wage. We're, dealing, we're going to be dealing with high road contractors, people that are professionals, people that pay decent wages, and uh, we're not going to have an issue getting people to work these jobs because the jobs are going to be uh, good wages, good benefits, meaning healthcare, retirement, and um, additional training benefits. So um, we'll find the people, as long as the contractors bidding on this work or on a level playing field, which they mm -hmm. are, the way the bill is written, we're going to be dealing with high road contractors and uh, the work will get done. And it'll be done one time and under budget. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Bob, Lynn, uh, could you make a, a couple of closing remarks for us? Sure, <clears throat> good good to be with you this evening. Sorry I was late, I was having some issues with my uh, phone here as I was driving along. Um, the, the thing about the infrastructure bank, uh, when it comes to finding people to be able to go to work, et cetera, much like Lou was saying, uh, it's pretty simple. When you pay people a decent wage, uh, it's amazing how many people will uh, step up and want to work. Uh, myself, I had a uh, two degrees in college and wound up going into the trades uh, many years ago. And, and luckily for me, when I got in, I was able to be able to, to make a, a, a good living, be able to uh, provide for my family. And I've been lucky enough now to be retired for a number of years so that I can focus on trying to get uh, this legislation passed. And, and I'll tell you that uh, at the end of the day, people are looking for that peace of mind to be able to have that uh, uh, a pension, the health care, like Lou said, et cetera. And, and when they have that, people will uh, rediscover their ability to be able to work with their hands and be able to help rebuild this country. Uh, unfortunately, uh, much of what Lou was talking about, where you have the contractors who go and undercut and try and do everything on the low side instead of actually uh, paying people what they're worth. Uh, it, it has been a struggle to be able to find people <clears throat> to do hard work and not get paid well for it to be able to make it happen. So uh, I really believe that <clears throat> if uh, this was to go through, wages were to then be there and established, et cetera, as the work increased, wages would go up. As wages go up, more people would uh, be willing to get in the workforce and be able to do the work that's necessary to make this happen. Um, and the, the only other thing I want to say about this National Infrastructure Bank is simply this. At the end of the day, it's going to take all of us to do our small part in order to be able to make this thing move forward. Because uh, <clears throat> none of us can do it all but all of us can do a little bit. And I think it's important that we all try and do our little bit, reaching out to uh, families, friends, organizations we're involved with, uh, uh, people we have influence over to be able to get them to understand the importance of being able to invest in ourselves, because that's what this is. This is an investment in each other. It's an investment in, as Americans, not as Republicans, not as Democrats. It's, it's investing in ourselves much like uh, they did uh, when Alexander Hamilton started this whole thing back right after the revolution. So it's really up to us to be able to step up and be able to make that uh, difference at the end of the day. Yeah, Thanks a lot, win. Julie. It's a win-win all the way around. I, I agree. Um, well, thanks everyone for your attendance and your participation in this evening's webinar. We're going to bring it to a close and we do have a couple ending slides uh, that we'd like to put up.
So uh, the first thing we usually do is exhort people to call Congress and ask them to support our bill. Now, of course, I've already reminded everyone that the bill is going to be resubmitted soon, hopefully by the end of this month or the first week of March, and it will have a new number. And as soon as we have that new number, we're going to be going back out to y'all and asking you to call your congressperson and ask them to support or be a co-sponsor um, of uh, the, new, the new bill, whatever the number will be. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And here is our uh, NIB info. You see our website here, our Facebook page, our Twitter, our email. And again, I would just um, um, sincerely urge everyone to visit our website. And if you can, click on that donate button and send a donation our way. It helps pay for these webinars. It pays for advertising. It pays our office expenses. And we wouldn't be able to do this without your help. So thank you very much, everyone, and looking forward to seeing you on our next Zoom meeting. Happy President's Day. Thanks so much for the great presentation. Thanks. Happy Bye. President's Day to you all. Bye-bye. Thank you very all much. Right, thanks. It was wonderful.